All right, we're going to keep it rolling here. A recent mantra among many workplaces has been work smarter, not harder. Granted, it's still good to work hard, but work smarter. <laughs> One entity that is trying to adopt this line of thought is the Tucson Police Department. By using GIS data to drive decision making, certain policy decisions will be based less on hunches and anecdotal evidence and more on trends and factual data collected by the department. With the Open Data Initiative, sponsored by the White House and President Barack Obama, the Tucson Police Department has been empowered to release certain data sets to the public. Presenter Greg Rothwell has been given access to one of these data sets pertaining to bicycle and pedestrian collisions in Tucson, and will present findings to us this evening that will hopefully inform the Tucson Police Department policy in the future, and also pave the way for increased data sharing between the department and the public. Greg. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Greg, as John said. So I'll be going over um, bicycle and pedestrian collisions within the last um, year between September 30th, 2015 and September 30th, 2016. That's when um, this data set was. So um, this all began with what was called the Open Data Initiative. That was um, one of the many different projects that Barack Obama has done re regarding 21st century technology and 21st century policing. Uh, 21st century policing came about from wanting to um, engage better with the community and also to bring police departments and other law enforcement agencies across country up to date. Um, this particular open data initiative here in Tucson was a partnership um, between the Tucson Police Department, the University of Arizona, and the city of Tucson. So this open data initiative, um, sponsored by the White House, um, the Tucson Police Department was actually one of the first 15 agencies. I believe more have joined now, but I'm not sure exactly how many there are up to date because there's more and more joining all the time. But uh, the Tucson Police Department is very proud to be one of the first 15 of those. And they're releasing specific data sets over time. Um, this is the very first one, uh, pedestrian and bicycle collisions. In fact, um, this, this particular smaller project began only in October, so it's very recent. Um, they had a data sharing event as well. The data sharing event was where they got people from the community, um, different organizations. Uh, you guys are probably familiar with this room, I hope. Um, but So they did it in this same room. It was many police members as well as other members of the community. Uh, play Where's Waldo with trying to find me in there. So this is us going over the, the pedestrian and bicycle collisions and um, entering them into... Uh, in Esri Geoform, Esri has been very helpful with providing a lot of technology for this project as well. Uh, I mean, to begin with, I used ArcMap and um, a little bit other Esri software myself, but also um, the Geoform and Survey123 were used um, for this event. And my particular take on this project was doing visualization and analysis. So the first part of that visualization was to make maps and also um, graphs and charts to illustrate patterns that are going on with these pedestrian and bicycle collisions across the city. Um, like John, John was saying in the introduction, um, getting rid of those anecdotal um, evidence and trying to go more toward using hard data, um, something that um, the Tucson Police Department has um, not quite done as much as it will in the future. And aside from serving as an outreach tool, um, we also wanted to do some deeper analysis as well, um, look at whether or not these pedestrian and bicycle collisions were clustering. If there was the possibility they weren't clustered, maybe they just happened everywhere across the city, then it would be very hard to do any analysis. So the first step was to determine whether or not they cluster. But if they do, we wanted to see which roads, which intersections, um, and if there are certain attributes, um, types of roads that these were occurring on. So first, I'll give you guys a glimpse of the data that was used. Um, there were 208 bicycle collisions in this year-long period, 263 pedestrian collisions. The saddest part is there are probably a lot more, especially with hit-and-run collisions and um, collisions that didn't result in injury. So all of these resulted in either uh, anywhere from minor injury to a fatality. And um, so many hit-and-run collisions are never even reported because there's no hope. But the ones that we do have, we were able to analyze. And um, to plot these points on the map, we used um, an ArcMap geocoder, although some of the addresses were um, obscure sometimes. So sometimes Google Earth was used as well to 
um, help us get an approximate location. So this is Tucson. Some of you are familiar with the city limits, um, that red area right there. And it's located in southern Arizona, as most of you also probably know. But we didn't go outside the uh, city limits. We stayed um, within the city limits or some of these collisions that occurred very close to the city limits within 800 meters were included as well. So this is a map of the bicycle collisions. You can already start to see some patterns probably. We'll dive more into those when we do some um, more hard analysis. But the two red dots on there are where the fatalities were, surprisingly close together. And then the injuries and hit and runs um, kind of spread around, but sort of clustered. The pedestrian collisions were much more spread across the town, although there are still locations where um, they happen more often. You can probably see some patterns there. Uh, we also used other data from Pima County and Pima Association of Governments and the city of Tucson. Uh, most of it was from Pima County, but the Pima Association of Governments had some very helpful um, data on sidewalks and what are called traffic, traffic message channel points. Um, I'll go over those more in just a minute. The average nearest neighbor analysis was our first method. Uh, this was to de determine the clustering extent. This is a really great tool that uh, is in the Esri ArcMap software. Point density and kernel density are in that software as well, and these um, were very helpful in highlighting the intersections. And I think these will actually be the most helpful maps for um, the police department to take a really quick glance and be like, that's where we need to go. The geographically weighted intersections and traffic normalization goes over um, how many collisions are occurring at specific intersections. So this analysis only looks at intersection-related collisions. It ignores non-intersection-related collisions. But um, what's fascinating about that is that between one-half and two-thirds of collisions occur at intersections. So intersections are a very common location, and this became its own um, study in its own right. And then proximity analysis looks at um, the attributes of where these collisions are occurring. Um, the proximity just means that these collisions are being joined to the nearest street because they're not occurring um, exactly on the street. When we do the geocoding, they get geocoded to an address rather than um, put directly on the street, which is um, nearly impossible when you're working with um, data that is compiled that way. So these are um, the pedestrian collision Average nearest neighbor reports, there's a lot going on here, but um, basically what's important is the z-score and this p-value, um, and this is for the actual collisions. So the p-value of zero means that there's basically a 100% chance that these intersections are, or that, sorry, these collisions are clustered. And the same with the z-score as well, that's a standard deviation number. So um, negative 13, which that rounds up to, would be it's um, 13 standard deviations away from um, being completely random in terms of being clustered. If it was a positive z-score, that would mean that they were surprisingly um, far apart, which, is, which would be a little unusual for this particular study. And then what I also did with Average Nearest Neighbor to kind of do a double check on are these actually clustered was I made a random data set of 263 points, the same amount as the pedestrian collisions, and these actually had um, a very low p-value and z-score as well. So they might not actually be that um, clustered, 13 standard deviations, since doing random points on the grid um, makes four standard deviations away. So um, whether you do multiplication, or sorry, division, or subtraction of the standard deviations would give you different amounts, but even considering that, we can see that these are much more clustered than the random points, so I consider them clustered. And we have the same pattern with um, bicycle collisions as well, and this should be bicycle collisions, not pedestrian collisions, but um, bicycle collisions had negative 11 and a half standard deviations, and the randomized one had negative 4.6. So they're actually um, slightly less clustered than the pedestrian ones, according to uh, this, this particular examination. But we can still say they're clustered, and that's what matters. For point density, um, this is the practice of taking the, all the collisions together and seeing, um, making a raster out of it and checking the cells and seeing where the highest values are occurring. 
So each cell on the map will count um, how many collisions are occurring at a certain distance. I chose to do 800 meters. Um, I tried a, a lot of different um, distances, and 800 meters seemed to be the best, as well as using um, a cell size of 200. And this gives you an idea of where the collisions are occurring, but it's kind of interesting with point density because um, right here is an extremely high value, but it's actually between all the collisions. It has the most collisions that are 800 meters away, but it's not where they are. They're actually at this intersection to the right, Grant and Alvernon, and also um, over here near um, Grant and um, Campbell and so on. So point density actually um, would optimize you um, where you could locate, say, a police officer and have them be as close as possible to as many future collisions, but it wouldn't put them at the collisions. So instead, kernel density is better for that because kernel density factors in how close the collisions are. Um, a collision that occurs one meter away is going to send the value much higher than a collision that is um, 800 meters away. So kernel density um, is used in a lot of different ways for a lot of different studies, but for this particular um, street network-based study, I decided that 800 meters, again, would be the, was the best out of all the different options I tried and the same 200 cell size. So this map is somewhat useful. It shows you, oh, there's a corridor right here where there's all these collisions. So you could try to patrol that corridor, but that wouldn't be very efficient kind of going, um, doing like an S shape. Um, you want to know exactly what intersections those are occurring at um, if you're in the police department. So to fix that, what I did was um, use, um, use a maximum radius of 800 meters, just like I did with point density, and then it only factors in collisions up to 800 meters away. So rather than making one giant pool of um, trying to find the hot spot of the whole map, it highlights um, smaller intersections. And now you can actually see that Granton First is a high value, Granton Alvernon is a high value, the downtown area um, is a high value. And over here, um, Broadway and 20, sorry, Broadway and uh, Wilmot is also a very high area. Bicycle collisions by themselves are extremely clustered and in hot spots. So um, I think this might be the most useful map of all the density maps because it really highlights where we can concentrate our police forces. Um, who are specifically looking for bicycle safety. There's basically like six spots where um, the most collisions are occurring. Pedestrian collisions, on the other hand, are extremely widespread across the city. For some reason, Broadway and Wilmot and Granton First are way worse than all the others, but um, there's still a lot of other really bad spots across town. It might be hard to concentrate forces because of how many Intersections have um, around three or four pedestrian collisions near them, but this map can still be helpful. Uh, geographically weighted intersections involved creating buffer zones around um, the traffic message channels that we got from the Pima Association of Governments. These traffic message channels are at um, every major intersection in town and a lot of the minor ones as well. Um, Glen and Mountain would be an example of a minor intersection where these collisions are occurring. Um, and I used a 25 meter buffer zone. I figured that if the, if the point was geocoded to within 25 meters of the intersection, it's close enough. Um, you, you couldn't do like a one meter intersection because it just wouldn't account for enough that are actually intersection related. So there's 395 total TMC locations across the town, but only 74 had bicycle a bicycle collision uh, one or more, and only 100 had one or more pedestrian collisions. So most of these TMC locations are irrelevant for this study, which makes the, the next map easier to understand. But the, you guys can see here, um, for those of you who are familiar with Tucson, where the um, worst bicycle collisions are and where the worst pedestrian collisions are um, in town. On the east side, um, pedestrian collisions are an extreme problem, whereas on the west side, um, bicycle cl uh, collisions are bigger problem, probably because um, not as many people must be riding their bikes on the east side. So this map shows the intersections using the TMC locations and blowing them up a little bit because if I only showed the 25 meter buffer zone, it's nearly invisible, but um, the, the darkest red is where the most bicycle collisions are occurring and the, the 
beige is where there's one bicycle collision, and then most of them are invisible again. The pedestrian collisions, I did the, the same thing here. Um, again, you can see they're all across town, but um, Broadway and Wilmot and Grant and First are the um, worst intersections for pedestrian collisions. So those could be intersections to, to uh, target for the police. And each DMC location, conveniently, um, this is why they exist actually, has what's called a daily traffic value. And the daily traffic value shows, on average, how many vehicles are traveling um, through this intersection. And the data actually ranges from 2006 to 2016. So um, some of them might be a little outdated, but the vast majority of them are updated through um, 2015. I think over 95% of them are. And uh, the majority of these highest values, which means the highest traffic, um, actually appears to be occurring through Midtown and Eastern Tucson. This doesn't take into account um, the interstate freeways. I'm sure those have the highest. Um, but not, not any bicycle collisions or pedestrian collisions are occurring on the freeway, except for maybe um, a very few and none in this study. So I, I did a graduated symbol map for this one. So the smaller circles represent lower traffic and the higher circles represent more traffic. Midtown and Eastern Tucson is right here. So you can see these are higher for the most part than the ones in southern Tucson. And northwest Tucson is still pretty high, but not quite as high. Actually, downtown's a little misleading. You see a lot of small circles, but the streets are closer together. So there actually is a lot of traffic downtown. It's just not all traveling on one particular street, except for maybe Broadway and Congress. And then I divided the number of accidents so um, from the previous um, um, chloropleth map um, where, I, where I showed the, the number of collisions at each intersection. I divided that number by the traffic volume. This would show um, not necessarily how many, inters how many collisions are occurring at that intersection, but how likely any given car is to be in an accident at that intersection. So um, intersections that only have one pedestrian collision, but there's not very many cars, that's actually maybe more concerning than a heavily traveled intersection with five um, because each car is more likely to get into one based on those statistics alone. So we can see in downtown there's actually a lot of collisions per vehicle that traveled through that intersection, as well as on Pantano Road um, for some reason. Pantano Road um, has a moderate traffic volume, but it's getting quite a few uh, collisions considering that. And then um, I did the same for bicycle collisions as well. Um, these are very clustered in downtown and uh, western Tucson for their, for their high values for the most part. So proximity analysis, I looked at four different layers in Pima County, and I joined uh, the collisions to those, to those layers to see what the attributes were of the collisions there. So the first I did was the road infrastructure. That means the type of road, whether it's a frontage road along a freeway, major, minor, or a state route road. And a state route is actually essentially the same thing as a major road. Um, it's just the state highways like Oracle, Miracle Mile, Aviation Highway, and Ajo Way. Um, so we see the same pattern for state route and major local road because they're, they're similar routes. But the blue bar represents the number of the total number of collisions. Um, so the most important thing to take away from this is that there's a lot of collisions occurring on minor roads, but when you factor in how many minor roads there are in the network, it's actually very unlikely for a collision to occur on any given minor road um, when you divide it by the number of or the length of those roads in the network. And I and the same thing with. Um, speed limit values, um, and again, for all of these, we see the same pattern between pedestrian and bicycle collisions, um, but you have the total number of um, collisions at each speed limit, and for here, instead of minor roads, it's the 25 mile an hour zones. We're seeing um, what looks like a lot of collisions, but actually very few for each segment, and however you look at it, the 35 and 40 mile an hour roads are where the most collisions are occurring. And then for joining these to bicycle lanes, um, we, I did a slightly different take. Instead of um, doing the number of collisions and the number of collisions divided by, I did the percentage of that um, length of the attribute in the network. Um, so for bike, bike route striped shoulder, this makes up half of the network, but has two thirds of the collisions. 
Um, the most important one to take away from this is that the shared lane markings, this is ones where bicycles and cars share the road in a single lane. Um, these are actually the most dangerous inter, uh, roads. So I've been telling the police department um, that these shared lane marking roads um, appear to be the most dangerous. And then you see that for the shared use path, there's no collisions. That's because this is um, like the Relito River path and paths where cars can't go at all. So that's inevitable. And then I did the same with um, sidewalk type. So not all of the road network had sidewalk information, um, but the vast majority actually did. And you can see that um, most of the collisions were occurring at no sidewalk or um, where there's a good sidewalk. It's kind of interesting that um, where there's some asphalt and concrete and some dirt and rocks, there actually seems to be very few collisions, but that's probably because there's not a lot of people walking. So as we, as we went over, um, average nearest neighbor showed us that these collisions are definitely clustered. There must be a reason. Um, geographically weighted intersections show us um, that there's particularly bad intersections in eastern Tucson and midtown for pedestrians, particularly bad ones in western Tucson for bicycles. And uh, the traffic normalization can tell us a story about how safe it is to drive through those intersections. Um, proximity analysis showed that 35 and 40 mile an hour roads were um, the most common um, by total collisions and by um, collisions per length of the network. And um, major roads and frontage roads need to be heavily looked at. It's kind of surprising how many of these collisions are in frontage roads actually, but um, it's definitely something for the police to look into. And then for uh, bicycle lanes and sidewalks, we need to look at those uh, shared lane markings and also um, where there's no sidewalk at all, that's a surprisingly high amount of collisions. And then the density maps just highlight the areas in general, which varies. Um, what's next? The Tucson Police Department will be um, doing more with the Open Data Initiative in the future. This is a very new start, but they're going to be releasing more data sets on top of these collisions. And they're also going to be um, automating them into a database by sometime later this year. And then for me, I'll be helping them with um, channeling this analysis workflow into Model Builder through Esri to um, make this a more automated process. And we're also looking into using uh, some more sophisticated analysis as well, like Gettys or G-Star and Cluster Outlier Analysis. Does anyone have any questions? We're actually going to hold off on questions. If you have any for Greg, make sure you connect with him at break. But we're going to move on to the next presentation. Thank you, Greg.